Thank you all for coming. We're excited you could be here. It's a special evening we've been working on for a long time. We haven't done a good Kishmaka business event in Crown Heights since last year when we did the expo. And uh, you guys are in for a special treat. We work very hard on tonight's program to really bring you top-notch people to share their wisdom and help you grow your businesses. Before we get started, on your table, we printed these little cards. You're all welcome to take them home. It's a double-sided, but it's called, on one side it says a selection of business advice and guidance from the Rebbe. The other side it says Segules for the Rebbeim for Parnassa. So if you go to the Rebbe's business advice, which is not exhaustive, but the number one item, which is well known, the Rebbe said in 1988, when people were asking for what his advice is when you need business advice, he said that uh, you have to atzaz yedidim mevinim. You should consult with good friends that are knowledgeable. That's the number one top advice that the Rebbe gave to business people, and that's what tonight's event is about. Tonight's event is we're bringing from Crown Heights Yedidim Mevinim, people that are knowledgeable and they're compassionate community members and they're here to share their wisdom. And we have a distinguished panel that's going to come up now to discuss important topics. And so without further ado, I'd like to call up the panel. Um, we'll start with, we have actually a special guest. Uh, three of the panelists are local, but we had one of our panelists who came all the way in from Lakewood, and we're really honored that he could be here. Moshe Rosenberg, Michael Rosenberg from Plastic Place. Thank you very much. If you want to come up, Moshe, come, come. Special thanks to Mendy Lieberman who helped to, to, to help us to get Moshe to come. We'd like to call up Moshe Malamed from Madway and Israel Rappaport from Digital Pavilion. Everyone can grab a seat. And our MC for tonight, Ari Marinovsky from Out of the Box. You guys are in for a treat. So uh, without further ado, Ari. Diversification in e-commerce. I feel it is a very subjective and difficult topic to tackle, but we're going to try. A, a better title is How do you manage the choppy waters of e-commerce today? I think a couple years ago, 10 years ago, you go to e-commerce event, like it was packed. There's like you know hundreds and hundreds of guys, and now I think they're all doing cash advance, right? The people that are here. We're, we're the guys that are left. We're trying to stay scrappy and make it work. So we have three guys over here that are pretty experienced and hopefully they can help us. So let's start just by getting some intros, some background. How did you get where you are today and how did you get started in e-commerce? Israel, let's start with you. Good evening. Um, I got started in e-commerce. One of the earliest guys in e-commerce um, started over 20 years ago uh, when there was no there was no Amazon buy boxes or anything like that. I started on eBay actually. Uh, it was at that time I was a teacher uh, in, in our town, and uh, someone asked me if I could get him a certain camera, one of the first digital cameras, and I found a way of buying it and I took my credit card and I went out there with money I didn't have and I bought a few of those cameras and then I said I got them for you and he said nah I don't need them anymore so I had these five Canon cameras and I had nothing to do with them and that's how I got into e-commerce I went on 
Wild West and it's all uh, within, within a day I doubled my money and just got, got really excited about it. Seems that in Crown Heights, at least, to start e commerce, you're best off first working in Altera for a while. I also did that for two years. And afterwards, my partners, Toby Greisman and Shmeir Hirsch and Olaf Shalom, they had already started before I got there. And at the time, they were really focusing on high end refurbished office chairs. And as I came to them, they were just starting to pivot into manufacturing their own furniture. I started first, I said, let me take over your advertising with Google AdWords, which was a lot easier then than it is today. And that worked well. And I said, how much are you guys doing on Amazon? Not that much. How about I take over that one? And, you know, it grew from there, and here we are. All right. Michael? I also went to Mary Lee <laughs> <laughs> um, Started about 16 years ago selling, uh, for the trash bag business, selling shopping bags across the country, trash bags online. And I never intended to stay in e-commerce. And the uh, challenge of succeed. And uh, 16 years later, working through uh, selling Magento, now Shopify, learning Amazon and the other platforms, uh, we brought this down to being able to build a successful business and uh, had a lot of fun along the way. Of course, no downs, only ups, but um, lots, of, lots of fun along the way. And now we bought a, another business, e-commerce out in uh, Pittsburgh, uh, online stores, which has been an interesting challenge. So it's... Uh, Excited to be here and hopefully we'll add some value to your night. All right. So, um, great. Idea. By the way, can I get a chair? Do I have to stand the whole time? challenges that I've had in my business. Is finding that balance between selling on the marketplaces and something that both of you have mentioned, which is selling on your own channels through Google AdWords and building out your own storefronts and websites. For some reason I've been selling on e-commerce for 16 years. I've, I've never found that magic touch to be able to capture my own customers, sell refurbished electronics. And I always just found myself just gravitating back towards the eBay's and the Amazon's and the Walmart's. How, how should we think about building up our business on the marketplaces, which can be very profitable, but also you know, having a long-term vision, and especially as some people are thinking towards exits and you have a higher valuation than you own the end consumer, how should people be thinking about that balance between selling on marketplaces, either via private label or reselling, or building up your own website and, and, and owning your own customers? Anyone who want to answer? Yeah, I think it's specific. Yeah, I'm glad you gave an example because it's, it's, uh, it's unique. And I, I personally don't know how you would do that using refurbished electronics. It's not easy. You tried? Yeah. by the good old days when it was easy and quick. And the reality is e-commerce today is no longer easy and quick. Uh, those of us, as I think you mentioned beautifully, that have stuck it out, uh, you know, are still here, and we persevere through some of the ups and downs. It's achievable, it's not easy, and you need to be you know, committed. Specifically how you can do it depends on your specific circumstances. Right, sure. That's my I'll widen the lens a little bit since not everyone should have their own website, not everyone can build their own brand, especially if you're selling other people's products, it may or may not be the fit for you. But if you zoom out a little bit and kind of look at diversification of the topic on a broader lens, I look at it kind of like in a war. So if you're fighting a physical war and you're trying to protect yourself from getting wiped out, which is I think what we're all trying to do, besides for growing and all that, we're trying to stop somebody else from growing at our expense, 
In a war, you can protect yourself by fortifying around you, being at the top of a mountain, putting up a moat, putting up big walls and all that. And you can also fortify yourself by spreading out, like it says about the Eivishter of the Yidden, that he spread us amongst the nations, were a lot harder of a target to take down that way. So, if you look at it the same way, you can try to protect your business by patents, exclusive agreements, um, building your brand in a way that makes it harder for someone else to copy you. And you can also build your brand by spreading out, whether it's additional channels online, additional relationships online, offline, online plus offline, anywhere in those areas. And it's a mix of those that are going to give you the best level of protection that you can get. And for some people that may be pushing your own website, which I'm sure will give you a higher valuation if and when you sell if they feel that you acquire and you own your own customers, but that's not always a good fit. And for some people, it may be a mix that does not include that, but includes some of the other things mentioned. Ezra? So, um, I fall a little bit into your category. Uh, we've been reselling other people's products, and that makes it exceptionally difficult to really find a way to differentiate yourself. Um, Moishi mentioned over here the, the idea of, I, th I think one of the big mistakes that people make is that they look, oh, this guy is selling on, that, on Walmart, I should also be selling on Walmart, or this person is doing that, or this person has their own website. But really, that's not always true at all. There's certain items that do really well on places like Wayfair, and because they're home related and they're fur furnishing related. And the, I think the most important thing that a, that a person needs to think is like if, if your business becomes a commodity, if if you no longer have anything that sets you apart, then you have to find how do I stop being a commodity? And sometimes that's just because you're a really charming person and you're really good at relationships and people like you. So then make sure that you're the person that gets on the phone with people or you're the person that actually makes the deals happen. Don't let other people do it. And sometimes it's differentiating the products, sometimes it's differentiating the platforms, and sometimes it's selling on Walmart. But don't do it because other people are doing it. Do it because you figured out that for this type of product, this is the right thing to do. Or for me, this is the right thing to do. So differentiation has to really be a result of your specific circumstances and what you're dealing with. Got it. So I'll tell you a quick little story. My wife was doing Shalach Manas for my kids, which I'm sure all you guys had to deal with. I, I think Shalach Manas has got to be downsized. It's way too complicated and expensive. But anyway, she was looking for some like fillers for the bags, and she bought on this website called Timu for 70 cents bag fillers. And she bought a bunch of them, and she needed one more. So she looked on Amazon, and it was $9.99. I'm thinking to myself, how the heck are these people on Timu, which is a new app for anyone that hasn't heard of it from China, can sell something for 70 cents? How does that make sense? And I'm thinking about all the people that are online sellers and competing with either their manufacturers directly that are selling in China, or you know somebody buying from their manufacturer and just competing with them directly on a listing. How, how does somebody handle that level of competition? And are we all, is China just going to absolve us? Like, you know, how do you think about handling that competition in, in a commoditized market, Michael? Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's, people have existed in commodity markets forever. And some people walk away and say, commodity markets, I'm out. I want to distinguish myself. Commodity markets, you can still distinguish yourself, but you're not distinguish yourself on the product. You're distinguishing yourself on your service, on your good looks, on your negotiation skills, on your uh, sales team, on your experience. There's many ways to distinguish yourself and you try to detach yourself from the commodity as much as you can. And there's many examples of companies that have done that well. It's, it's most challenging. It's a lot easier to find something unique and patent it and then ride the waves of that. But for everyone chasing that, there's about I would say one out of a thousand success rates in, 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 in the pursuit of that. The reality of it is, Tina was a great example. They're you know, trying out, they're, they're taking America over by storm, and, and they're, they're a great example. Many businesses are open right now on social media selling directly. They literally just drop ship it from, from Tina without even touching it. And, and you can build a business there as well. So that will be a wave until that becomes saturated and, and moves on. But um, I, I think when you're, when you're running a business and you're trying to 
find a quick thing or the quick fix, you're, you're, it's only going to last as long as the fix will. But if you build a foundation and try to distinguish yourself around a team that is constantly evolving and not just looking for a quick fix, you're going to find a lot of muscle developed over time. And you're going to have those wins that will fuel them and lessons that you learn as long as you're continuously evolving. All right. So, I don't know if everyone should be in a commoditized market. Some can handle it, some can't. You know, Walmart does well in a commoditized market. They sell everything at the lowest price. They go through a lot of volume. Costco does that. Target maybe plays it a little differently. So, for some people, the answer is once it becomes saturated and commoditized, you should probably try to move either up market or always introduce new products that are ahead of the competition or move into some other area, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. For some people, it's okay to play in a commoditized market, just realize that if you're in the commoditized market and that's your game, you have to play it very tight. You know, if you look at those that are successful in commoditized markets, you're dealing with low margins because it's already been compressed by competition. You, you need to do extremely high volume with high turnover of your SKUs. You have to have a very low cost structure, probably don't locate your warehouse on the East Coast or the West Coast, probably put it somewhere cheaper. Get as cheap labor as you can and count those nickels and pennies that make you profitable. Because in a commoditized market, it's very easy to do a lot of revenue. It's very hard to actually make money. And if you're going to play that game, then realize that that's the game you're playing. And don't have fancy offices, and don't have fancy anything, and really keep your costs as low as possible, and try to keep that volume running in a way that you're actually profitable, and make sure you're actually profitable. Huh. Yeah, one of the benefits of actually dealing with commodity products is that if you buy it right, it's already sold. So. Yeah, it, you know, everything has its own set of challenges and opportunities. Um, you know, you deal in refurbished electronics. If you buy your electronics lower than someone else does, the deal is made, and you've made your money. So it, it just becomes a different, a different game. Um, I, I, I once had an interesting conversation with uh, the head of the third party of Amazon. He's no longer there. This was about ten years ago. Um, his name was Sebastian Gunningham. He's a brilliant guy. He used to run the whole third party business and we were sitting in his office once and we were debating and he was saying, this was in the really early days, it was before Timo was out, just you know, a little bit of Alibaba and he was saying the future is China direct and this is where everything is going and people are going to be buying these cheap products and the Chinese sellers are going to be selling their product directly to American consumers. And I didn't disagree with him, but I told him for every Chinese seller that is going to be selling you a product for a dollar, they're creating an opportunity for you to sell a product for twenty dollars. And I gave him an example at the time that imagine you're buying yourself an iPhone charger uh, from a Chinese seller for a dollar, and you plug in your thousand dollar iPhone, and you plug it in, and, you, and it blows. And you think to yourself, I just bought a one dollar charger for a thousand dollar phone, and why am I doing this? And you're not gonna be looking for a dollar fifty or a two dollar charger, you're gonna be looking for the twenty dollar charger. The next charger is not gonna be the one dollar charger. You're gonna say, I want something that is very different than what I just bought. So, like you mentioned before, you know, if you if you just make yourself like every other Chinese seller, there's no, there's no room for you. Right. They're better at it, they can work with lower margins, they're the manufacturers. We can't win in that market. The only way we can win is by using the specific advantages that we have to set to set ourselves apart. We have one quote that I think is valuable. But you know, we come from the firm world, and in the firm world, sharp business buyers and, and consumers is something we take for granted. You step outside the firm world, it's a radically different experience. And I just met a guy who's in a very, very competitive commodity space, and. I was asking, like, how did you become so successful? And he's like, I, I don't touch the West or East Coast. I, I only deal with Middle America, and I'm dealing with small mom and pops. They can't get over my service. They go nuts over me, and I get my high margin, and I do business all day long. And I know at least 10 of his competitors that are struggling to get by. And this guy is, again, I haven't inspected his books, but the indications are that he's focused on, he's a commodity item, but he got out of the rat race of trying to get every piece of business to focus on where the margins were, which they still are, the country the huge place. Yeah, keep in mind also, you know, you can make a dollar on each product and sell a hundred products and make a hundred dollars, or you can sell two products, you know, at fifty dollars and make the same money. 
if you have the right margins. So sometimes if you go on market, you may not have the top line sales, but you might actually make more profit and more money. That makes sense. I'm hitting Middle America tomorrow. Uh, so a, a lot of us, I'll, I'll say me specifically, we kind of fell into our industry and we've been doing it for a while and you know, you wake up one day and you, you know, realize you've been doing something for 15 or 16 years. And, and that's really my story with refurbished electronics. But, you know, Robert Wordy was asking some people to send in questions before this event. And one of these questions, like, really hit me like a ton of bricks. And one of the questions was, what would you do if you were starting out from scratch today? And I was thinking to myself, like, I don't know, man. I don't know if I would be still selling, you know, an iPhone, buying it for 500 bucks to make 20 bucks, and then the guy is going to return it the next day because uh, his Wi-Fi is not working or something. So I'm going to ask the same question to you guys. Obviously, this space has evolved tremendously. What would you do if you were starting out today? Sorry, we'll leave my on you. Yeah. Uh, that's a tough question. It's, it's a really tough question. It's hard to imagine it when you have the years of experience you have. And, and, and to answer that question honestly, I go back to what I was. I was in Exeter Row. Uh, I was going to come home and do mortgages. And um, this opportunity to buy this small business came up. And it, great. And my family's in the manufacturing world. Plastic. I like plastic. I jumped into it. So I would start again, specifically in e-commerce. Um, I would still invest in it. I, I still do believe firmly in it. The, the reality of it is I'm 41 years old. I'm no longer 24 years old when I started. And I don't have the energy and passion and, and that I used to have. But it's a wonderful vertical to invest in. I don't think it's going anywhere soon. It's going to evolve, and you'll evolve, and the business will evolve, and then rinse and repeat. Um, I, I, I don't feel that I would do something else. I've, I've toyed with it over the years. So I've had lots of self-doubt. Maybe I should do this, maybe I should do that. I assure you, trash bags is a very boring business. Um, maybe something more exciting would be better. But um, I personally think e-commerce is, is it's in its infancy. It's, it's only 20 plus years old, and there's a whole lot of runway left. Definitely a tough question. I guess you could always go back to teaching for a couple of years. But if we're starting today and doing an e-commerce, I probably want to focus, I mean, again, this is looking at it the way it is today, try to find products that are as complex as possible, as much trust required as possible, and essentially try to look at it, what would you not want to buy from a Chinese seller that you can't pronounce his name, have no idea where he is, and he'll change his name again tomorrow and try to find products or categories that fall into that group. That's probably the, at least one way to look at it. I don't know that I would get into this business right now. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, the honest answer. No, just kidding. You definitely need muscle that comes at the time when you need it, hopefully. So. Yeah, and I, at the same time, I want to say that I admire all the people that do. And there's been a lot of very successful entrants into the business. Uh, in the last few years, but the luxury of looking back, most likely I wouldn't do anything different. I would do all the same mistakes again, but I'd like to think that maybe I would set up my business in a better structure. Uh, I would try to actually set it up with proper, a proper corporate structure in a way that I can grow rather than trying to take a basement business to $100 million, try to really build a business that is designed to scale properly so that things don't break along the way the way they do. But I can honestly say that I would actually be able to do that. Got so it. You ask me for a camera. <laughs> then you're back in business. <laughs> Maybe. So you, you actually, you, you, good segue into my next question, which is I think a lot of times you, you learn more from your mistakes than from anything else. So you guys have been doing this a long time. What, what are some of your bigger mistakes that turned into big lessons that helped you get to where you are? Yeah. Yeah. Boy, fantastic. That's a long list. Um, I think you touched on structure. I think that took me a long time to learn, and frankly, still learning. Uh, I'm a very big fan of the EOS model, which I think covers an incredible amount of ground on the structure piece. And I don't know if you looked at it. 
I, I found it to be transformational. The, the what? EOS. EOS. EOS is a program created by Gina Wickman, Entrepreneurial Operating System. And I, I've, I've come across many things over the years, and I usually find them unattractive. Well, at first I find them attractive for, for a week or so, and then leave it. But EOS is something that, as I've gone through it, as the company has gone through it, it's uncovered and allowed for people to find their place, and myself included, and to help define roles, and to give people clarity around, hey, where we're going, why, what are the rules of engagement, and what are the deliverables, and really, we all go to work and want to make, be successful for what reason, and, and if we kind of get that answer clear, most people I find don't. It took me many years to even begin getting it clear, and I would say I'm in, in the process still, but it's, you want to provide for your family, you want to raise your kids well, you want to be a decent person, you want to be respected, you want to learn and grow, and the, the process is comprehensive. So one thing that I think was a mistake, I've, I've tried hiring a lot of people that I thought were capable of leading the company, taking over all of my uh, things that I found challenging to run the company. I've gotten that one more time than I'd like to admit. And um, going through this process has allowed to get to the bottom, get to the root cause, what's going on, why? Oh, okay, cool, There's this, these are your strengths, what are your weaknesses? And you get comfortable facing these things openly with people, sharing them, all of a sudden they step up and like, hey, that, that's, that thing that you've been doing, thinking you have to do it, you don't have to do it, I'm really good at that. And you can allow yourself to lean into these conversations in a way that people show up, they love working, they love coming to an opportunity, to a place where they're appreciated and allowed to flourish. And there's no greater joy than, than watching people um, thrive and grow, so. Thanks. So, I don't know if mistake is the right word because ultimately these things are all part of the growing experience and they're all part of learning. So you try things, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work, sometimes they work for a period of time, sometimes they don't. So I could point to many hires that didn't work out or many hires that were kept on longer than they should have been and you always look back with the benefit of hindsight and you're like, I knew it the whole time. It's like you look back and you always knew that this wasn't the right person, or this person shouldn't have been doing this, or I shouldn't have been doing this, someone else should have been doing it. And sometimes you only get that with the benefit of hindsight, but you try to get smarter over time, you try to learn from your mistakes, and while you don't have the energy from when you were 20, whatever you said, hopefully you have the wisdom at least that comes with age. Yeah, so you basically didn't make any mistakes, is what I heard. There's all mistakes around right. the, along the road. It's not right. like this major catalyst that I could work through and say, this was the mistake that, you know, that destroyed the place. So it's, Got it. uh, I don't know if you want to get me started. On yeah, that. yeah. <laughs> I think some of my mistakes are sitting in this room right now. <laughs> I mean, in a good way, people that I that I lost, that I didn't appreciate enough at the time, and um, uh, definitely doubling down on people that are valuable and that are going to make all the difference in the, in the company, and you know, cutting cutting your losses early enough, but. One specific thing, um, because there was always this fear, when you're selling on a third party platform, you never know what, the, what, you know, what they're gonna do next. You don't own your customers, you don't know if, you're, if, if there's another day. So over the years, we, we've taken out a lot of money from the company and invested it in other things, and to a point where we actually hurt the cash flow of the company. And I, I do believe that a lot of people are guilty of that. And I think one of the things that is not appreciated enough is that companies go bankrupt mainly because they go into negative cash flow. You know, it's not always because you because you're not profitable or anything. You know, it can be you can be a very profitable company, but if you cannot pay your bills when the bills come due, because the, the money is coming in, you know, way later than when it goes out. That's the number one destroyer of companies. It makes everything more expensive. You end up taking bad loans. Uh, you, you end up doing bad moves in the company. So, you know, keep, keep enough money. Keep a cushion in your company. Stay cash flow positive, and it's going to help you a lot, too. Got it. So, my next question, I'm going to ask you guys to take out your crystal balls. You know, I think it's a... A Wayne Gretzky line, he says that, um, and I'm paraphrasing, that I, he skates to where the puck is going, not where the puck is. So looking ahead, what does the future of e-commerce look like? 
is, is it going to be like an AI TikTok bot that's going to just sell us something to a chip in our heads? How, how should sellers think about the future and, and what state, steps should they take to prepare? And Michael, it looks like you're chomping at it. I am. I just can't wait to say it. I'm waiting for the answer. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. We're all going to do what Mushy does. Yeah. Because he doesn't exactly. make any mistakes. He seems comfortable about yeah. everything. That's not what I said. I just said that the mistakes are part of the process. Right. Go ahead. Uh, 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 Anybody uh, else? Nobody I, knows. It's a tough question. I mean, uh, to me, roll with the changes. Keep your, keep your ear to the ground. Right now, I don't see any changes I'm making. At AI, I'm trying to learn a little bit and plug it into the business. We haven't been able to do it yet, but the people I hear are doing it wonderfully for customer service. Uh, I know one guy I met with, he cut his uh, team down in half, and customer service has that going up. I haven't seen it myself, but that's what he said. I, I haven't, haven't done it, but that's, right. that's all I can ask. I guess it depends how far out you go. I mean, in the, the short term is easy, easier to predict, at least with being wrong most of the time instead of all the time, than the long term. But in the short term, I'm assuming Chinese sellers will be more and more. They'll continue selling more and more products directly. Things will get more and more commoditized on the marketplaces. Um, on the other hand, people do seem to be willing to pay more for a certain level of trust and a certain level of experience. If you look at your own Amazon shopping history, you'll probably see that the items you bought, they're not the cheapest. Maybe they showed up to you first, maybe they just looked a little bit more legitimate or something like that. So that may give you at least a little bit of a hint of where things are going in the short term as far as AI. I mean, we'll probably have to bring Chip in us before we understand what it's doing, so I don't have much to say on that one. Right. Israel? Yeah, no crystal ball, but um, AI is definitely going to figure in very, very significantly. And it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic. I mean, Michael, what you mentioned over here, um, a lot of the younger generation, a lot of the people that are coming into the space right now, they're, they're sort of native to the, to the AI space, and they look at things completely differently. Um, I'm invested in a company which is run by a younger guy, and he has 10 x himself with AI. He, he is 10 times more productive than me. He's using AI tools all day, every day, to accomplish literally every part. And I think, on one hand, just continue doing what you're doing. Do not lose focus, because the regular part of business remains, and if you, if you lose sight of that, and that's going to destroy you quicker than anything else. But at the same time, um, if we don't evolve along with it, if we don't use all the tools that are available to us, then there's going to be people that can create the same listings, the same websites, products, designs, logos, uh, strategies, marketing, 10 times better, 10 times cheaper than us. And we're going to, if you can't do it, if you're too old for it, if you're not ready for change anymore, then bring in some people that see the world through that lens. So, can you share any examples of what he's doing to 10x? Yeah, I was going to ask. Uh, yeah, I mean, one interesting thing is that he had, he just did a, a podcast with Mark Cuban, and he used an AI to figure out how to get to Mark Cuban, and he like he hacked the system to get to him, and. Uh, just basically let the AI figure out when to contact them, how to contact them, and all that, you know. That's just one example. Yeah. That's amazing. But definitely for product descriptions, I think probably most people are using it already in some shape or form. That's like the easy one. In terms of the long run with it, I mean, keep in mind, you don't have to be first to use it to be able to use it effectively. And I don't think the companies that have made it have quite figured it out yet, so I don't know how many of us are going to, but definitely keep your eyes open while you continue doing what you're doing. Got it. Roman, do we have some uh, time for crowd questions? Yeah. One. One crowd question. Okay, who's got a good question? A really interesting question. Anybody? Yeah. Somebody yeah. shot. This guy's weird. Got a question? They don't fight. This guy, uh, Ron, what do you got? So we've been talking all night about. Uh, speak loud, speak loud. We've been talking all night about B2C business to consumer e commerce. And there's a big movement around B2B e-commerce. I just like to hear some comments about where you gentlemen think where the last 10 years has been focused on hyper growth in, in B2C and predominantly direct to consumer. What do you think over the next 10 years in terms of like people buying online wholesale? Good question. Go ahead. It's a great question. 
not sure to answer that specifically, but to me, the general trajectory I see is only improving. Uh, the more you make life easier for people, the more you're going to be able to command business. We, uh, th that's been the MO for me all along. Just there, there's e-commerce, the basic difference between traditional business, and I don't know if this is being guilty of an oversimplification, but you don't have the luxury of sitting across the table from someone and getting to know them. You have your website representing you, your business, your values, your service, your product, your quality, your team, your responsiveness. It all has to be communicated in a short way. And if you're able to continue understanding the needs of the business buyer, you'll be able to capture their business because you're going to make it more friction-free than the next. So uh, to me, we're, we're betting on that and investing in it and, and, and uh, believe deeply in it. So I'm not sure how you're defining B2B. Probably a lot of everyone selling here, there's probably B2B customers there. A lot of B2B customers at this point look like B2C customers and shop on the same places. If you're looking at it from wholesale being more of a relationship base and a long-term base and repeat purchase base, there's definitely value there, that's for sure. People are more comfortable making more purchases and more frequent purchases online. And if you can pull it off, and I'm not saying I have the answer of how to, but that is another differentiator that will hopefully make it a little harder for the Chinese coming after you, if that's what you're afraid of. Yeah, I'm not sure that I fully understood the question, but I, if the next 10 years are going to be all about trust. That's it. I mean, if you can def uh, create an environment where people can trust that you are real, that your products are real, uh, like uh, almost radically honest, I think you'll differentiate yourself enough to really matter to a lot of people. All right. Where do you want to take us on, Okay, so first of all, a good round of applause for our panelists. And the nice thing is that they're not going to, they're not going to leave. We're, we're switching over now to the round tables, and they're going to hang out. If you guys want to talk to them, they're going to be here. You don't have to sit up on top anymore, but please, we're, we're going to start here. Please don't run out. This way everyone can come have a chance to speak, to speak to you privately. So thank you again one more time, a big round of applause, and thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to be transitioning now. This event is called The Huddle. So, um, if everyone could please just keep seated here for a minute. It's very important. One second, please, guys. If we could just keep the room quiet for two more minutes, and then we're going to... Then it's going to stay noisy for the rest of the night. Bottom line, this event is called The Huddle because of these round tables here, and in just a few minutes we're going to start to huddle. We have tremendous people here that have come, some have come from very far to share their wisdom tonight, and I want to point out who we have. The way it works with the round tables is that you can pick a round table, but you don't have to stay at the round table, you can switch tables, you could also get up and you could eat sushi and talk with our vendors. But we have very talented people here. We have one of CHY's board members, Nussi Sternberg, who's going to be sitting here. He's going to be talking about strategies of shifting to FBM. Okay, we flew all the way up from South Florida. Yechiel Weinfeld and his partner, Yehuda, um, I didn't put it on the paper, so Kanowski are here. And they're going to be talking about how to find a niche product. For, okay, for those of you looking to find product and how to get a niche, this is the table you want to be at. Okay, we have Amazon marketing strategies. We have Eli and his father, Avram Israel, who are brilliant marketing strategists, and they're going to be running the, the marketing roundtable. Operational strategies. Okay, we have Nathaniel Newman, who came all the way in from Kingston, Pennsylvania. He's brilliant in business operations, and he's going to be running the operations roundtable. We have, we're very lucky, people don't notice, we have one of the, the most talented Amazon lawyers. Okay, Moshe Wartner, who's here tonight. Um, who was supposed to be in South Florida, we agreed to come here. He's going to talk about if you have issues with Amazon, legal issues, you want to sit at his round table, he has tremendous insight. All the way from Las Vegas, Gabe Gillis that came in, he's going to be talking about adopting the right strategies for success. He's one of our popular e-commerce mentors. We have Gershon Muchnik, who's going to be talking about warehousing and logistics. He is the head of operations at Prune. And all the way from South Florida, we have Samach Simon, who's a brilliant and accounting and numbers for many people that struggle with knowing if they make money, and he's going to talk about that at his roundtable. Now, before we go to the roundtables, this event could not have happened without the sponsors. Okay, if you look around the room, we have many vendors that came here that put down nice sponsorship to be here. 
and to support this event. I want to give some of these vendors an opportunity to come up and just talk for 10 seconds about their business. I want to start with SBA Loan, Yankee Markowitz is actually a board member for CHYE. Yankee, can you please come up for one second and talk about SBA. I have to say, by the way, Yankee and SBA are one of the most traveled vendors in Crown Heights. They go to every show. Their business is really everywhere. His face is on every Mishbuffalo magazine and every Yami magazine. He's a brilliant marketing strategist, aside from an amazing business. And thank you for being a board member. After that introduction, I don't really need to say anything. Uh, as a CHYE board member, I'd just like to thank everybody for coming out. If anybody has any questions about financing, specifically in SBA financing, we're going to be in the corner and come and say hello. That's it. Okay, thank you. I want to give a shout out. I don't know if he's still here, but uh, Mendel Grossbaum. Are you still here? He left? Anyway, but he sponsored the, the lanyard tonight. He's a talented ph photographer if you, for, for, for weddings and simple as Mendel Grossbaum. Okay, next up, CHYE. Every table has this, okay? We have a mentor program. All year round, you could request a business mentor. We have many of these people running round tables are available to be mentors. And this year, we, we rebranded as the Level 8 Mentorship Program. And there was three companies that not only sponsored the event tonight, but there are corporate sponsors. And I want to call up Shia Gorkin from Ainsworth Gorkin Law, who's not only a sponsor of tonight's event, but a sponsor of our mentor program, just to share a word or two about Ainsworth Gorkin. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Thank you, Rabbi Wardy, for putting together such a beautiful event. Uh, my name is Shai Gorgon. I'm a, an attorney and co-founder of Ainsworth Gorgon PLLC. We are a law firm based in New York, and we represent various businesses. Uh, we, we guide businesses through various legal issues, and we represent businesses in, in contentious litigation matters. So if you have any questions about Anything legal, please feel free to come over to me and I'm happy to talk to you about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, guys, if I could just hold everyone together for two more minutes. I'd like to call up another corporate sponsor of our mentor program on tonight's event. A good friend, former employee, turned entrepreneur. That's what we do. People that work for us, we turn them into entrepreneurs. But I'd like to call up Barry Volosov of Be Hired to uh, share a few words about his very popular recruiting company. Thank you, Rabbi Wordy. I'm usually up here talking about other stuff. Uh, I'm Barry from Be Hired. Um, we all know what makes great companies is great employees and having great talent on your team. It's nice to see some of you in the room. Um, if anybody, if you're looking to hire or looking to grow your business, uh, let's connect. Okay, next up I'd like to call Naftali Shaw from Seller Chain. Naftali. Are you here? Yes? Somebody want to come up from Seller Chain? All right, we'll come back to it. Um, just going in order. Is Yossi here? Yossi Lapidus from Rightfully. If you want to come up, please, very quickly. Guys from Seller Chain, where's Naftali? Tell him he, oh, you're here. Okay, so you, Naftali, come up, please. But guys, two more minutes, please, if you don't mind, if we could just keep it down. Okay, very strong in my life. Usually I don't speak, especially not in public. But I want to briefly introduce myself and our company. Uh, my name is Yossi Lapidus, I'm from Argentina. I spent many years in Granite, currently living in uh, Five Towns, New York. I am the founder and CEO of Rightfully. We get back what rightfully used. Um, we do what uh, recovery audit, people know as reimbursement, uh, reconciliation. We have been doing this for many years for, uh, for Amazon sellers. Seller Central recently launched our solution for uh, Vendor Central. Um, very, excited, very excited about it. Um, 
You know, people describe me as a perfectionist, detail-oriented, and I try to bring this um, quality and thoroughness to the labyrinth of, of Amazon. Um, it's also in our name, rightfully doing, doing things right. Uh, within our, yeah, so I'll, I'll say it briefly, within our differentials is our user portal, so we are welcoming you to shop at our booth and explore it yourself. Um, especially the new uh, removal tool, how we call it. Um, we also have some advanced cases, feel free to ask me about what we call internally as the RCM case, uh, evolving to transfer losses, and um, if you'd like to understand a bit deeper, you know, I, I would be happy to explain that further to you. Uh, lastly, I want to mention payments and fractions. Uh, some of you might have noticed, but if not, um, it's uh, something that happened recently for one type of reimbursement and can be significant. Uh, basically, if you download the reimbursement report, think that the reason for payment retractions, you might have been getting uh, significant payment retractions, there is reverse and reimbursement, and uh, we automatically, uh, in our company, track those and credit uh, but make sure that you uh, notice that and request that from your provider. Um, okay, thank you all. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Now, Kelly, are you close by? No? Okay, yes or no? Yes. Okay, next. Someone want to speak from AI Digital? Okay, Avram, Israel. General advertising goes to related, related to here Amazon advertising. And people say, Well, I don't have a private label, I don't have to do advertising. So, in, I'll try to do 30 seconds why that is not true. If you take a little piece of paper, it'll exp explain it. If you are have a, a, a same, same listing as I have, you uh, let's say there was a thousand impressions on the page, on the top line you get 300 clicks, on the third line you get 50 clicks. So, if it was two people, we both get 50 clicks. But if you go, do advertising, you get up the first line, you're splitting a thousand clicks. You get, you get 500, 250 clicks. The point is, even if it's a private label, even at a low ACOS, you can double your business by doing some basic, basic profitable advertising. That's it. Okay, from Gatida, Yoni Mazor, please come up. Guys should get ready, everyone just. All right, thank you very much, Robert Wordy. Um, quick question, who was in the Ventura event last year, right? Who was in Ventura, anybody? Nobody, okay, good. So this is a good event, Robert, because we brought new blood, fresh blood, so it's a real privilege to be able to be part of this. First of all, so thank you for having us here in Crown Heights. Uh, I think Ellie from our team uh, had a vision and dream kind of to create an event for Amazon sellers within the community. And honestly, Robert Wordy, Thank you for reminding me. I do want to say that the whole event of tonight was really down the gas front. We got the gas going on. I wasn't about to thank him. I was about to thank you, Rabbi, because he said a few words. And, you know, I wish you had this kind of thing. And Rabbi, where are you? Boom, like a real true Chabad, you know, visionary action taker. He did it. We're all here. So it's a blessing. So thank you for having us. In a nutshell, what we do, we do AP auditing and reimbursements. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Always happy to help. We'll see some you know, friends and clients. Uh, it's love, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Amazing Lister Shia. Do you want to come up? Come over here. Thank you very much. Ellie. There's somebody, Ellie, who I've never met. And uh, if you can take my picture and send it to me, I'll know at least what part of the room you're sitting in. I think it was Winston Churchill who said, to speak for two hours, I don't need to prepare. To speak for five minutes, I need to prepare. To speak for 30 seconds, no speech, just a pitch, or really a short thought. Gentlemen, ladies, you are investing in your product, your brand, your store, and when you Make a listing. You, when you, and this is true for any e-commerce, 
and you don't optimize your long tail, short tail, outlier keywords, you are leaving a audience out of the question, out of the potential, and that may be a small or even a big audience. If your main images are not screaming, if they're not popping, then you're leaving it to chance. There's nothing that says pick me. And if you're a B plus, your A plus, your premium A plus, your brand story, storefront, everything on the conversion side, not the click, but the conversion side is not up to par, you're leaving the conversions at not maximizing your potential. So for 10 years now at Amazing Listeners, this is what we do. We give people manufas and nefesh and success, and we have a track record of doing it, and perhaps it's a partnership opportunity for some of you. I hope you'll uh, take the opportunity to come by. Thank you, Ruby Wordy, and thank you, everybody. Okay, Isaac Gross, IGPPC. Thank you so much for having a Satmar Husen here and Chabad. So we manage the PPC, which is what? We manage the PPC, which is the Amazon advertising for many Amazon businesses. Our specialty is we have an in-house team for you guys at Cronites. We're 20 minutes away. We have over 15 account managers in-house. We manage over two billion dollars in annual sales. All of you, every account has a dedicated account manager that you work with. You can WhatsApp them, you have a direct line. We really work with you as if you would have been an in-house employee. We recently signed up one of the largest accounts probably in this community. And they were a little bit skeptical. I just met them at a solid cloud event that told me this is the first time ever we're happy with the BBC agency. And we did a phenomenal job for them. We have many clients here in the audience, and I'm proud to contribute that to the community. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me. Yes, okay. I'd like to call up TC Logistics, a good friend, Spooky Kane, who's been uh, coming to CHY events for many years, and he's building a beautiful logistics business. Thank you, Robert Wardy, for uh, this beautiful event. It's uh, great. My name is Spooky Kane from TC Logistics. We're a third-party warehousing company that helps e-commerce sellers. We have three locations around the country on the east and west coast, and we're here for all your B2B, B2C needs, all value-add services. Reach out to us. We have a few customers floating around the room that could uh, vouch for us. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay, Click Industries, Mendy Levitin, Harav Mendy Levitin, the rabbi, former rabbi of Base Motion. Thank you, everyone. Um, everybody here was a private label seller. Um, we are private label sellers as well, and we sell with a lot of the major retailers online. Uh, that includes Chewy.com, PetSmart.com, iHerb.com, Target.com about a dozen others. Uh, very difficult to get onto a lot of these platforms. When you're on, to maximize, um, you need a lot of intimate knowledge of how that channel differs from Amazon. Besides, we're selling our own brands there. We uh, rep third-party brands. We're repping over 45 brands between all of our channels. So if you have a product or brand that you sell on Amazon, you might even sell on Walmart, maybe even on Target, but you think it fits some of these other channels, you want to see where you can grow. We don't charge any monthly fees, no flat fees, so we can only make money if you make money. If you want to grow your brand without adding any additional headache, speak to someone from our company here. The Yoni, me, Sroli, um, Shragi, Ronald, um, and we'd be happy to discuss it further. Shikaya. Okay, Akhar and Akhar Klavir, this is a really cool business, totally different than every other vendor that's here. These guys are a startup, and I, I'm proud to say that CHYE was able to be a part of their journey. It's really cool. Uh, David Katz come up from Archer Affiliates. You gotta hear this, this is really something special. Thank you for the intro, I'm Wordy. Uh, Archer Affiliates is a platform connecting Amazon sellers, private label Amazon sellers, with influencers and media publishers who drive traffic back to Amazon. All sales are tracked with Amazon attribution. And the coolest part about the program is we charge no upfront fees, no monthly fees, simply commission of generated sales. Okay, please stand up. Ray Stern, he has a new company. He's a Seller Cloud consultant. And if you are working with Seller Cloud or thinking of working with Seller Cloud, please go to his booth. Came all the way from California, Dovi Lipinski. His company is called Numetri. Dovi, do you want to stand up for a second? Where are you? Dovi? Dovi Lipinski, are you in the room? Just wave your hands. He does custom software for Amazon businesses. Tremendous new business. CHY also involved in helping him get started. Very proud of it. And then last but not least, Shmaya Grossbaum, are you here? Shmaya? Shmaya, are you in the room? Level Up Listings, Listings Company, are you Shmaya? One more time, are you here? Okay, okay, we're starting the huddle. All the round tables, please. 
jump around the round tables, join, get started for brand, have sushi, talk to the vendors, do business, grow your business, enjoy the evening.